Good morning, everybody. Today I'm going to be presenting some progress and development uh, on producing a sulphide targeting tool, particularly for uh, the exploration of disseminated sulphides undercover. The motivation for doing this work really came from discussions with clients who were requesting a the development of a tool that could give them a, a good idea or, of where disseminated sulphides actually exist, but in particular at what depth they exist undercover. The second demand or the second reason for, for doing this study comes from the, uh, I guess, a couple of diagrams that are well entrenched in, in geology and mining at the moment. And that is the uh, progressive decrease in the uh, number of deposits, tier one deposits that are being discovered. And you can see on this left hand side here, you can see that over time into the future, the demand for the mineral resources, be it copper or any other mineral, is actually going to outstrip the supply of, uh, of mineral resources and in some way we've got to work out a, a way to fill this gap between um, supply of metals and the, the demand of metals and this really comes from the, the decrease in the discovery of, of tier one type deposits. In the past most, most tier one type deposits have been discovered near the, near the surface and that has been the window of opportunity but more recently uh, the surface is becoming less and less uh, opportunistic so people are starting to look deeper undercover and I think the uh, the next major tier one resources are going to be discovered undercover so the new window of opportunity for exploration really lies between two to eight hundred meters depth and so in order to make these discoveries we have to get much better at, at imaging or, or detecting these sulfides undercover and that's what uh, that's what we're trying to do using the uh, the ad rock equipment and so ADROC have been around for quite some time and they've been recording data over a variety of different mineral deposits for well over 10 years. Um, the equipment that they use is uh, shown in the top right corner here. This is the uh, it's a pulsed radar tool. It has a transmitter and a transmitting antenna, a receiving unit and a, and a receiver antenna. The uh, transmitter generates a pulse at between about one to 70 megahertz, which is sent into the ground. And just like ground penetrating radar, for example, that, that energy is then reflected back up to the surface from boundaries where there's changes in, in dielectric permittivity. And the reason it works so well for sulfides is because the dielectric permittivity of sulfides is so high relative to the, um, the rocks in which they're normally contained. So granites, for example, granite, sandstones, shale and metamorphic rocks sit down here below, well below 15. Whereas sulfides, on the other hand, sit way up here above above 30, and typically up to about up to a value of about 80, and so they produce they, they form a very very good target for for radar. The other good thing about this equipment is that it's small, it's portable, um, it can be used in really rugged terrain, and that makes it a per perfect sort of greenfields exploration technique uh, to be used for targeting targeting sulfides. So if we have a look at uh, a bit of background information to put things in perspective, this is a case study that was undertaken by Naval et al. in, uh, in 2018. And what you can see here is a neat set of experiments where they embedded a whole lot of grains with different radiuses and different dielectric permittivity values within clay and um, got a synthetic image of what that might look like in ground penetrating radar. And what you can see here is although the radius uh, might change a little bit, and the dielectrics might change a little bit. The really changing the radius has no major impact on the quality of the image. Really what really jumps out in this one and in this case study is that the by increasing the dielectric permittivity to values of around 30, which is significantly higher than, than the, um, the material that it's contained within, the quality of the image increases dramatically. And this is equivalent to say embedding sulfides within a um, a meta sedimentary or, or sedimentary host rock, for example. The other really interesting result that they uh, show in this paper is if you have a homogeneous medium, the variability in the uh, return signal is going to be much, much lower than, for example, um, <clears throat> the return image from a heterogeneous medium, in, which may have, for example, sulfides embedded in it. And so you can see in this case here, when there's lots and lots of grains, lots of interference, the peaks and troughs are much, much greater than the peaks and troughs are in a, in a homogeneous medium. And so that's important for some of the results that I'm going to be showing you today. 
The other really interesting thing here is that typically radar will follow the same um, rules and principles of reflection and refraction. If you direct the energy towards a, a dielectric layer, um, a high dielectric layer such as uh, massive sulfides, some of that energy might be reflected, but very, very rarely in geology do we get a perfect dielectric mirror like this. So if we zoom in on this in a little bit more detail, what typically we find is that the grains and the sulfide grains and minerals um, existing with those grains have all different orientations and they have crystal faces in different orientations. And because of this irregularity, some of the energy will be transmitted through down to the next layer where it can be reflected. Some of the energy is reflected off into the country rock, but more importantly, some of some of that energy is reflected back to the surface where it can be recorded by the um, by the receiver antenna. Okay, so <clears throat> why target disseminated sulfides, and and what are some of the questions that we're trying to to answer? Uh, we came into this by thinking: Do sulfides have a a unique geophysical fingerprint? that can be detected using the uh, the pulsed radar tool? And can they be distinguished from, from just the normal sort of siliciclastic or silicic country rocks? Uh, can we help constrain the target, um, especially the depth of the target? And can we pro therefore provide a probability map to um, increase the or decrease the risk associated with putting a drill hole into the ground? So when ADR has been collecting data for, as I said, for, for over 10 years, the data is typically the same for every uh, survey. And so there's lots and lots of sets of data that we can um, do experiments on. And this is a typical set of data that's collected during a field survey. Um, the data is broken down into, into well, into uh, eight main data sets. There's two groups here, the frequency data, which is shown here in green and the energy data, which is shown in blue. Um, this is the, the harmonic data. And you can see here that there's variability in both of the, um, the frequency and the energy. And we want to look more at more detail into that, that variability. <clears throat> what we ended up doing was deciding to, to choose the top four or the, the highest four and lowest four peaks in the, in the curve to try to pick out the area of the most variability with any, within any scan. And to do that, what we've done is assign the, the highest peak or the highest trough a value of four, the second highest peak a value of three, third highest a value of two, and then the fourth highest a value of one. And we can do that for the four lowest values, but also for the four highest values, which you see here in, in the EADR, for example. Um, and then we can apply this across the, the entire data set so that the four highest or lowest peaks in any one of these data sets can be, can be extracted out. Once we've assigned the value to the highest and lowest peaks, we then go and assign a depth of influence. Uh, for the highest peak, we have plus or minus 20 meters, then plus or minus 15 meters, 10 meters, and five meters. So each of these values has a depth of, depth of influence associated with it, as well as a value. Uh, what we do then is we can compile all of the results and we end up with a stacked bar graph like this here. Um, the different colors represent the different, um, the different harmonics results. And you can see in this instance here, we use eight sets of, of harmonic data. When we stack them all, the highest variability or the zone with the highest number of occurrences sits here between about uh, between 600 and 700 meters. We can trim that down to only three components, which makes it a little bit quicker and we seem to get a pretty similar result. Um, and what we can do is if we have a drill core such as um, shown over here, and this is an actual case study, we can see that the sulfide correlation criteria match quite closely with the, uh, with the sulfides at depth. And um, in order to quantify this a little bit further, what we've done is we've selected values of over 20 in the eight correlation criteria as representative of sulfides, and in the three component correlation criteria, over seven as being representative of sulfide. So what I'm gonna do now is show some case studies from where we've actually applied this weighted correlation criteria um, and where we have drill cords that correspond with the, the results. So here, for example, we've got a value of over seven at about 680, 690 meters deep. And that corresponds very, very well with the occurrence of sulfides at about the same, same depth. And this is for lead zinc sulfides. Um, another case study, another result, 
Um, here we have an inferred mineral resource given in cross section. These scans aren't quite on the cross section, so they don't they may not match up exactly with depth. But here we have um, values of seven at around 300 meters, and again values of, of seven to eight at around 250 meters, and that corresponds pretty well with where the um, where the sulfides occur in the um, in the cross section provided by the client. Another case study here. Um, again, we've got drill hole results, including this, the sulfide content in through here. Values of over 20 in the eight component and values of over seven in the three component correspond very, very well with the location of the sulfides at about 300 and, or between 300 and 350 meters. Uh, here's another case study. Again, we've got the, the drill hole data. Um, we've got the sulfide content, pyrite and sphalerite, so um, zinc sulfides in through here. Again, we've got the three component sulfide correlation criteria values of over seven at 500 meters, 520 meters. And again, here in the eight component um, sulfide correlation criteria of over 20. And again, these two values match up quite well and they also match with the onset of the sulfides at about 500 meters in this, in this drill core that was provided, again, provided by the client. Um, this is another case study where we had where we went back into some, some legacy data and we redid the correlation criteria. We found at about 500 metres, we got a value of over 20 um, in the eight criteria and a value of, um, of seven at about the same depth. And in this instance, we didn't actually have any dual core, but we, we went on the hunt and we actually found a PhD that had been published that shows the, uh, a cross section through approximately that area. And it seems to correlate very, very closely with the occurrence of um, lead zinc sulfides in, in drill core that were plotted on that cross section. So we can see here, this is a, a zoom in on this little section of core here. These are just the two values of over uh, 20 in the eight correlation criteria. And these match almost exactly with the occurrences of lead zinc that were marked on that, on that cross section. The other interesting thing about this uh, case study was that there was about 550 meters away, there was another scan taken. Um, there's no drill hole here, but in this scan here, while there are, there are high values, there's nothing over 20 or over seven in the correlation criteria. So we don't actually think that there's sulfides in this, um, in this area at all. So in summary, the, the preliminary results show good correlation between eight and three component sulfides. Um, we've only shown the case studies here for sphalerite, galena and pyrite. Um, the results obtained for a wide variety of depths and a, and a wide range of different rock types. So this technique doesn't actually require any drilling. It doesn't require um, us knowing what the, the rock types are. It's completely host rock independent. And what we're doing is we're really only picking up on the, the sulfides in the, um, in the subsurface. Uh, at the moment, we're using values of 20 and values of seven for the eight and three component respectively, but that may uh, change a little bit over time, depending on um, access to more, uh, more case studies. So finally, what I wanted to show was that instead of just doing single scans, we can actually carry out multiple scans at the one, one location at different orientations. And what you can see here are the results from multiple uh, vertical scans running down through here, and two 60 degree scans and another vertical scan back in the distance. The purple shown on here are the, the weighted sulfide correlation criteria results for just sulfide in these scans. And you can see when you start to compile multiple scans, you start to get a much better 3D image of what's going on in the subsurface. And in through here, we know that this is the, well, we've interpreted this as being the base of a grey wacky unit that contains the sulfides. And this sulfide occurrence here is actually confirmed in drill hole. These don't have any parallel drill holes, but we can see some continuity in the um, in the layer dipping over to the east here. Here we have two scans which are parallel to one another, and they have good good repeatability and um, good reproducibility, showing that there's sulfides at the same depth. And here we have a 60 degree scan intersecting a vertical scan, and again showing good repeatability and um, and good re reproducibility for the occurrence of sulfides. A depth. So we don't only have to use vertical scans, we can actually use, use angle scans as well. And so just to summarize, um, you know, I think we've made a lot of progress in terms of being able to differentiate disseminated sulfides at depth using the weighted sulfide correlation criteria. And um, 
as a final summary, I'd say that I think Adrock is pretty confident that the, these results represent a pretty major step forward in the use of deep penetrating radar to, to identify the presence of sulfides, particularly without needing any drill hole. And uh, the beauty of this is that it's, uh, it's environmentally friendly, it's safe, and it's, uh, and it's giving, giving good results. Thank you very much.